Avatar The Last Airbender is among my favorite series of all time. It has fantastic characters, an interesting world and lore, a compelling story, and features the greatest redemption arc in fiction. It's technically excellent, featuring great artwork, character designs, voice acting, and music. It's a great example of a child-accessible show that's still intelligent and mature enough to appeal to an adult audience. I'm not here to talk about the show as a whole, but rather the ending alone, because while I think it's emotionally satisfying and a good ending overall, it does have some pretty egregious problems that have always bothered me. If you haven't seen the show at all, I recommend watching it before continuing this video, as it really is a great story and it might be hard to follow my arguments without knowledge of the series. A quick recap of the ending for those who haven't watched it in a long time. Aang is preparing to face Fire Lord Ozai, but has moral objections to killing another person, though everyone else believes it's the only way to stop him. Fire Lord Ozai is a horrible person, and the world would probably be better off without him. But there's gotta be another way. This goes against everything I learned from the monks. I can't just go around wiping out people I don't like. What's wrong with you? If this was the real deal, you'd be shot full of lightning right now. Aang disappears to an island and conjures the spirits of four of his past lives to seek their advice. In various ways, they all advise him to put aside his personal moral beliefs and do whatever it takes to defeat Ozai. Everyone expects me to take the Fire Lord's life, but I just don't know if I can do that. I tried to be disciplined and show restraint. Fire Lord Sozin took advantage of my restraint and mercy. If I had been more decisive and acted sooner, I could have stopped Sozin and stopped the war before it started. I offer you this wisdom, Ang. Only justice will bring peace. You must actively shape your own destiny and the destiny of the world. Avatar Yang Chen in particular states that, being the Avatar, Aang can't choose to follow his own personal moral beliefs and must set them aside for the good of the world. All life is sacred. And I've only had to use violence for necessary defense. And I've certainly never used it to take a life. This isn't about you. Your sole duty is to the world. Sacrifice your own spiritual needs. And do whatever it takes to protect the world. We don't have a choice, Momo. I have to kill the Fire Lord. Aang discovers the island he's on is actually a lion turtle and learns energy bending from it. While the rest of Team Avatar deals with various other threats, Aang faces the Fire Lord, but it's clear from the beginning that Aang is outmatched. During the battle, Aang is knocked into a pointy rock which jabs his back wound and unlocks the Avatar state, allowing him to put Ozai on the back foot for the remainder of the fight. Rather than kill him, Aang uses the energy bending he learned from the lion turtle earlier to strip Ozai of his fire bending powers. Everyone celebrates the war being over, and Aang shares a kiss with Katara, closing out the series. Before getting into what I think are the problems, I'd like to discuss the good things about the ending. It's visually impressive and balances multiple simultaneous plot lines well. It looks and sounds great, particularly Aang's fight against Ozai. Everything has an appropriate sense of weight and scale. The ending ties up most of the loose ends and concludes in an emotionally satisfying way. Overall, it's a good ending. But, for all its successes, the ending has a number of very big problems. There's flawed logic and it cops out on large philosophical and moral conflicts. So let's get into it. Starting with the Lion Turtle. It's a deus ex machina that comes out of nowhere and makes little sense, sometimes literally. The true mind can weather all the lies and illusions without being lost. The voice is deep, echoing, and has been put through electronic distortion, which makes it difficult or impossible to understand. The true mind can weather all the lies and illusions without being lost. The true heart can tough the poison of hatred without being harmed. Since beginningless time, darkness thrives in the void but always yields to purify light. The first time I watched this scene, I had no idea what it was saying. It also makes no sense when Aang's friends ask bounty hunter June to track him down. She says this. Well, what does that mean? It means your friend's gone. We know he's gone. That's why we're trying to find him. No, I mean, he's gone, gone. He doesn't exist. 
but Aang isn't in the spirit world or anything, he's in the real physical world. You could argue the lion turtle is somehow masking his presence, but that would be personal headcanon, an excuse for something the show doesn't explain. The existence and nature of the lion turtle has never been introduced until this very moment. It's an ass pole, a new, hitherto unseen element introduced to get the writers out of a corner they'd written themselves into. The bigger problem here is how the show avoids challenging moral dilemmas. The big ethical question up to this point has been, how is Aang going to defeat the Fire Lord without killing him, or will he choose to kill him despite his moral beliefs? Then, instead of dealing with that choice and its consequences, the show sidesteps it by introducing energy bending and the Lion Turtle. I don't envy the writer's positions as I suspect the aversion to killing is born from Nickelodeon censorship more than any decision on their part. I find it bemusing how kids' shows draw this line in the sand regarding the subject of death. I understand not showing children graphic violence and gore, but why is death in and of itself a taboo subject? Anytime a character does die, it has to be by implication, like they fall off a cliff. This even bites Avatar in the ass earlier in the series when Jet dies in battle, but due to the kids' show censorship, it's very unclear, something the show itself acknowledges. Did Jet just... die? You know, it was really unclear. Characters aren't even allowed to say the word kill and resort to euphemisms. But I warn you, even a single step out of line will result in your permanent end. Children are more resilient and intelligent than adults give them credit for. They can handle the concept of death without being traumatized. When I was very young, I had a dog that I loved very much. Her name was Mitzi. <laughs> and she got to be old, and she died. And I was very sad when she died, because she and I were good pals. Mm -hmm. And when she died, I cried. And my dad said we'd, we'd have to bury Mitzi. And uh, I didn't want to. But my dad said that her body was dead and we'd have to bury her. So we did. I also think it's bad morals to teach that violence and killing are always wrong. It's commendable to look for the good in others and offer people second chances and a shot at redemption. But some people are depraved and unwilling to change. They did not deserve to exist in this world, in my world! Prepare to join them! In those cases, where leaving a person alone will let them bring more suffering and death to others, a pacifist mindset is immoral. A good story challenges its audience and asks difficult questions. We're going to find the man who took my mother from me. This is about getting closure and justice. I don't think so. I think it's about getting revenge. The monks used to say that revenge is like a two-headed rat viper. While you watch your enemy go down, you're being poisoned yourself. That's cute, but this is an air temple preschool. It's the real world. It doesn't serve a story to dance around controversial topics and engage in avoidance, but that's exactly what the lion turtle does. And I have to say, does the show really expect us to buy that no one has died as a result of Aang's actions up to this point? You're telling me none of these people are dead. I guess they're fine. Yep, must be fine. No one dead here. So Aang is finally facing off against Fire Lord Ozai. It's a tense showdown. At first, Aang seems capable, like it's possible he could win. But as the fight continues, it quickly becomes clear that Ozai is the much better fighter. Aang is just getting pummeled into submission. When I saw this fight for the first time, I was on the edge of my seat. And then the show completely cops out. But before continuing, we need to back up and talk about chakras. Aang learns from Guru Patik how chakras control the flow of energy through the body. In order to activate the avatar state and the vast cosmic energy it brings while remaining in control, one has to achieve enlightenment by letting go of earthly attachments. Now think of your attachments and let them go. 
Let the pure cosmic energy flow. Aang abandons his training early to rescue Katara. Guru Patik warns him that by prioritizing his love for Katara, he's locked his chakra. Katara's in danger! I have to go! No, Aang! By choosing attachment, you have locked the chakra. If you leave now, you won't be able to go into the Avatar state at all! Personally, while I think the philosophy has some merit, I find the concept of detaching oneself from worldly concerns to achieve enlightenment to be bullshit. The show itself doesn't take a stance one way or the other, even offering a counter-argument. I met with this guru who was supposed to help me master the Avatar state and control this great power. But to do it, I had to let go of someone I love. And I just couldn't. Perfection and power are overrated. I think you are very wise to choose happiness and love. Regardless, the show is set up that the only way for Aang to enter the Avatar state and thus defeat Ozai is to let go of his love for Katara. So the conflict is clear. Will Aang relinquish his love for Katara to defeat Ozai? But instead of Aang having to make a difficult choice, the situation is solved by Rocky Puncture. At the peak of the battle, Aang engages in a duel of souls with Ozai to remove his firebending, and the once again very difficult to understand Lion Turtle voiceover implies that whomever has the greater will shall be victorious. In the era before the Avatar, we bent not the elements, but the energy within our senses. To bend another's energy, your own spirit must be unbendable. Like the Lion Turtle, this ability hasn't been set up in advance, so viewers will likely have no idea what's going on. I certainly didn't know what was happening in my first viewing, and confusion is the enemy of tension. But the bigger problem is that Aang actually wins this battle of wills. So you're telling me that Aang possesses more willpower than Ozai. Let's examine what we know about the two of them. Aang is a free-spirited teenager who loves fun, pie-throwing, and penguin sledding. He can't stomach killing of any kind and is even a vegetarian. I'm even a vegetarian! Yes, he goes through a lot of development by the end of the series, but at his core, he's still an emotional, impulsive goofball. Meanwhile, Fire Lord Ozai is a lifelong soldier, highly trained in the art of war. He's mastered lightning bending, an extremely advanced form of fire bending which few can use, a technique that requires discipline and self-control. He's been involved in palace intrigue and political machinations for decades, presumably having had to outwit and outmaneuver numerous opponents. He's also a sociopath who thinks nothing of being ordered to murder his own son. My father, Fire Lord Azulon, had commanded me to do the unthinkable to you, my own son. And I was going to do it. He's a highly trained, highly disciplined leader and warrior. And you're telling me that Aang has more willpower. B. S. Lastly, I know this might be controversial, but hear me out. I don't think Aang and Katara should have wound up together, and I think the pairing of Katara and Zuko makes much more sense. Aang and Katara certainly have a bond. They've been traveling together for a long time and have fought in many battles alongside each other. But while Aang loves Katara, I never got the sense that she reciprocated his feelings romantically. Aang asks her about her feelings, and she says she's uncertain. I thought we were gonna be together, but we're not. I don't know. Why don't you know? Because we're in the middle of a war, and we have other things to worry about. This isn't the right time. There's a divide between the two when it comes to worldview. Katara grew up in a small village that was constantly being raided by Fire Nation soldiers. At a young age, her father left to fight in the war, and her mother was taken prisoner, never to be seen again. Just let her go, and I'll give you the information you want. You heard your mother. Meanwhile, Aang slept through the war, literally. His entire culture and all of his friends were wiped out, but while he suffered a great loss, it's something he only finds out about after the fact, not a prolonged situation he personally lived and experienced for years. Zuko, like Katara, grew up in perpetual fear and also lost his mother at a young age. Dad's going to kill you. I heard everything. Grandfather said you must know the pain of losing a firstborn son. You're lying. Dad would never do that to me. Azula always lies. Azula always lies. Mom? Zuko, please, my love, listen to me. Everything I've done, I've done to protect you. He too grew up preparing for his personal involvement in an ongoing war. 
When Katara and Zuko leave to seek revenge against her mother's killer, Aang is opposed to their mission, whereas Katara's and Zuko's thinking is in lockstep. We're going to find the man who took my mother from me. This is about getting closure and justice. I don't think so. I think it's about getting revenge. The personal histories and worldviews of Katara and Zuko align much more than those of Katara and Aang. It's also a pet peeve of mine when stories insist on romantically pairing characters just because they were each other's first interests. To be clear, I'm not a bitter shipper. I don't care who characters wind up with as long as it makes sense and is emotionally satisfying. To me, it feels like the writers paired Aang with Katara because it was what most fans wanted or what they thought was expected, not because it was the best outcome for the story. I think Aang and Katara being together doesn't make much sense and Katara and Zuko would have worked much better. So now let's go about fixing the ending. The rules are as follows. We are in the writer's positions during the creative process for the final four episodes. We can't change anything that came before them and we can't ignore Nickelodeon's censorship regarding death. We can change anything that happens in the final four episodes but should alter as little as possible. First of all, get rid of the lion turtle. It comes out of nowhere and hasn't been set up ahead of time. There's also no reason for Aang to be MIA just to have a mystery that's ultimately pointless. Just have Aang intentionally go off to meditate and contact the former avatars who give the same advice. Everything proceeds exactly the same way until the fight with Ozai. Lose the rocket puncture scene. Have Aang make an actual choice and decide to let go of Katara and thus achieve the avatar state. We're also going to get rid of energy bending. Like the lion turtle, it hasn't been set up ahead of time and it only exists to avoid intellectually challenging moral consequences. Next, Ozai has to die. Ideally, I'd like Aang to decide to kill Ozai to prevent any more evil actions from him, but the Nickelodeon censors won't let us have Aang simply cut him down ruthlessly, so we're going to have to fall back on cliches. Aang has Ozai at his mercy. He could kill him at any time, but he doesn't want to. Have Ozai go on and on about how foolish Aang would be if he lets him go, how he'll never end the war, and how he'll burn the world to ashes. Then Aang kills Ozai in a way that doesn't explicitly morally implicate him. Maybe he tries to attack Aang and his attack backfires, killing him, like his lightning ricochets or something. With those changes, we eliminate the out of nowhere, last minute excuses and allow actual moral consequences. Aang decides to undertake a new spiritual journey, traveling the world, fixing post-war problems as the Avatar, and reconciling his own moral stances. It might be too soon after they met and allied for Katara and Zuko to pair up, although I think it would still work. It would also make sense for a political marriage between former Fire Nation and Water Tribe enemies to mend relations. Zuko's a prince and the newly appointed leader of the Fire Nation, and while Katara isn't royalty, she is a highly respected waterbender, close friend of the Avatar, and a daughter of a top military leader of the Water Tribe. Zuko and Katara pairing up does leave Mei out, but I never took her and Zuko's relationship as being that strong. It felt more like a relationship of convenience to me. I'm bored. I know. I'm hungry. So what? So, find me some food. Sure. She can join Tai Lee with the Kiyoshi Warriors, or just do her own thing. And that's it. Those are the changes I would make to improve the ending. But there is one other thing I wanted to talk about, not about fixing the ending, but fixing a character. I always felt like Toph was the odd one out when it came to her involvement with Team Avatar. She's not a bad character, in fact I like her a lot. The problem is her motivations for joining the team and fighting the Fire Nation feel weak to me. Every member of the team has personal motivations to fight except Toph. Katara and Sokka's village was repeatedly raided by the Fire Nation during their childhood. Their father is actively involved in the war, and their mother was killed. Aang's entire culture and people were destroyed, and as the Avatar, it's his destiny and duty to bring balance to the world. Zuko, seeking redemption, feels a personal responsibility to liberate the world from their fear of the Fire Nation, and is working in direct opposition to his father and sister. But Toph doesn't have anything like that. She grew up in an affluent household in an Earth Kingdom city insulated from the war. She has no history of personal loss, stakes in, or family ties to the war, and therefore no strong motivation to join Team Avatar or fight the good fight. He's the Avatar, and if he doesn't master earthbending soon, he won't be able to defeat the Fire Lord. Not my problem. Now get out of here, or I'll call the guards. Even her blindness isn't a hindrance, and she lives a very comfortable life of luxury. 
Her only problem is her parents are overprotective and overbearing, a problem she's partly responsible for since she isn't honest with them about her true feelings and abilities. My parents don't understand. They've always treated me like I was helpless. Toph leaving with Team Avatar is a decision born from convenience and opportunity, not necessity. Her lack of personal connection or history with the ongoing war is a problem for the character. The show even seems a little self-aware of this when she briefly pairs up with Zuko only to deflate her purpose. Zuko needed to be redeemed in the eyes of each character he'd harmed, and the show wisely devotes time to doing just that. Everyone else seems to trust me now. Everyone trusts you now? I was the first person to trust you, and you turned around and betrayed me. Betrayed all of us. He has personal one-on-one -on -one missions with Aang, Sokka, and Katara, but not Toph. I know I shouldn't complain. My parents gave me everything I ever asked for. But they never gave me the one thing that I really wanted. Their love. You know what I mean? <sighs> Look, I know you had a rough childhood, but we should really focus on finding Aang. Toph doesn't join Team Avatar until after Zuko abandons his pursuit of them, so she doesn't have a history with him, but it still goes to show how the character doesn't entirely fit into the show. At first, I thought this would have required a drastic rework of the story. Perhaps the Fire Nation invade Toph's hometown and her parents are killed, Owen and Baru style, or they're taken prisoner and she has to rescue them. But I think all of Toph's motivational problems could have been fixed with one simple change. Give Toph an older brother. An older brother who was an upstanding, morally admirable person who left his wealthy family to fight in the war and who died doing so. This would give Toph a personal connection to the war, a desire to fight against and hatred of the Fire Nation, a reason to join the team beyond convenience and opportunity, and a reason for her parents to be overly concerned about her safety beyond simply being neurotic. And the best part is you wouldn't have to rewrite any of the series events. Just include a few short lines of dialogue where Toph and her parents discuss the older brother, maybe have one brief flashback. We can see the parents' desire to stay out of the conflict and keep their daughter safe, contrasted with Toph's passion for joining the fight and avenging her brother. Problem solved. Avatar The Last Airbender is still a great show, but I think these changes would have made it an even greater one. Thank you for watching.